Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to um, the IS3C workshop. Um, we have a packed agenda for you, and it's also the end of the day, so I want us to be expedient and um, get through the agenda. So just for everyone's awareness, Blount couldn't make it with us. He's online. Blount, we're sorry you're not feeling well, um, but happy you could at least listen in. Um, the agenda will be a brief introduction um, from about delivered by me, um, followed by the formal presentation of our uh, working group two report to the MAG chair, who's kindly joined us. Um, Janice will be leading on that. Then I believe we have presentation of the working group one draft report, which um, is um, going to be delivered by Nicholas. Then presentation of working group six, uh, which will be delivered by Louise Marie. Um, and then Allison Wild will deliver the IS3C Global Digital Compact contribution. Um, and then um, I have a brief one just on the work plan for 2023 and the work working group three, uh, followed by close, uh, sorry, Q&A and then, and then close. Um, were there any changes or any questions? All right. We have a big group, so making sure everybody feels like they have, um, they're prepared to deliver their, their time. All right, with, without um, further ado, I'll go ahead and read in uh, Wout's introduction, unless Wout, you feel up to it. It's nice to see you though. Any words? Uh, thank you, Mallory. Let, let me just uh, say a warm welcome to everybody. I'm very sorry that I can really not make it over there, despite being only 250 meters away. Uh, thank you, Mallory, for stepping in at such an extremely late notice. It's very much appreciated. Paul, thank you for being there. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot hand over the report to you myself today, but um, I'm, I'm very glad that you're there. And also there are sponsors from SIDN Fund and from NASC who will also receive the report officially today. So I think it's best, Mallory, if you just take over and that I try, <laughs> try to listen. Of course, yeah, pleasure to, to do so. Um, so welcome everyone again. Thanks um, for, to everyone for their time. So this is just a general intro of the IS3C sessions um, for your awareness. So at the virtual IGF in 2020, the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards, Security and Safety Coalition, or IS3C, was launched. This coalition brings together key stakeholders from the technical community, civil society, government, policymakers, regulators, and corporate and individual adopters with the shared goal of making online activity and interaction more secure and safer by achieving more widespread and rapid deployment of existing internet standards and ICT best practice. There's a bit of background. Just maybe everyone, if you can mute. Brilliant. Um, Internet and ICT security is an issue that is high on the agenda of governments, industry, and individuals alike. If anything, the pandemic has shown us how dependent we all have become of the internet and the ICTs for many aspects of our daily lives. It is also widely recognized that many internet-related products, devices, and services are increasingly vulnerable to security threats and the spread of online harms and criminal misuse. However, if relevant security-related standards and best practices are more effectively adopted and deployed worldwide, these risks can be reduced significantly. This will foster greater trust in the Internet and its related digital technologies and applications and the positive social and economic benefits of these transformative technologies for sustainable development will be fully realized for communities worldwide. The IS3C aims to ensure that standards and best practices play their full role in addressing these cybersecurity challenges through establishing the conditions for their wider, more effective, and more rapid adoption by key decision takers throughout the standards implementation chain in both the public and private sectors. This can be achieved only if there is a shared commitment by stakeholders worldwide in a new comprehensive and strategic approach. The IS3C has established a work program that first brings the critical security supply and demand factors together, and second proposes the best options for the deployment of key standards and best practices on both sides in the form of policy recommendations and practical guidance. These outcomes will be presented at IGF policy recommendations for dissemination to policymakers and decision takers worldwide. In this networking workshop, two more working groups announced their start 
for the first of January, and two or three announced their intention to start work in 2023. One more may, may follow later in the year. Two already active working groups present their plans for 2023. All need volunteers and funding. Funding to run the coordination of IS3C and funding to researchers when needed. We hope your organizations may contemplate participation and or support in 2023. But before we get to 2023, let's have um, our colleagues present one by one their work on the report from 2022. So going back to our agenda, I believe I'm handing the mic over to Janice first for working group two. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling in from Australia, and I'm going to share my screen. Try to. Uh, I, I think that I have a problem. Can someone in the room please share my PowerPoint? Do you have it, Mallory? Um, I don't, but yeah, you're you're in good hands. It's coming. Okay, super. So, first of all, a great thanks to NASC and um, to Sydney Fund, who enabled us to implement research in 2022. What was this research about? Well, our objective was to understand why is it so difficult to recruit young people or recruit people, recruit talent, in the cybersecurity sector. What's happening in the tertiary education sector? Are we striving for the same goals? Is there a gap? This is the objective of our research that we conducted throughout the year in 2022. We managed to reach, and I'm not sure if you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Can you see um, it? Or so not, not yet. yet, because I think you might need to stop sharing so that we we may share for you. Okay. Or if you click your window where the, ah, okay, that's fine. I think we can solve it now. Thanks. Okay, super. Are you able to see it as well, Janice, so that you know what slide we're on? No, I can't. Yes, I can see it. Great. Super. Here we are. So our objective was closing the gap between the needs of the cybersecurity sector and the skills of tertiary education graduates. And we managed to reach 66 countries in our study. Our study was broken down into two parts. Well, three, I could say. We began by interviewing seven leaders in various countries throughout Europe to really understand what is the issue, what is the scope, and what are the key transversal competences and professional competences that are expected of people entering the cybersecurity sector. Then we developed a survey on the one hand and reached more than 230 people in 66 countries with our survey. But at the same time, we had the great pleasure of working with young people in the uh, IGF youth and the APR youth uh, across many different countries. What did we do with these young people? We showed them how they could conduct interviews with people in their own country. And from there, we were able to gather granular information as well as the results of our survey. And of course, the survey is available to you if you would like to roll it out in your own country. Next slide, please. I don't see the next slide. <laughs> Not surprisingly, there was a huge difference in the number of females that answered, 73 males and 
26% uh, of females, and we also had great difficulty in reaching the under 35. This is really not surprising because this totally reflects the issues that are being encountered in industry. Diversity was underlined by all people who participated in interviews as being extremely important and yet, from this, we see that there simply isn't diversity in the field. Next slide, please. What did we discover? First of all, we created a model which comprises 10 competences, what we call transversal competences. If you look at the green, these, according to industry and according to education, are absolutely critical skills which need to be taught in education. So critical thinking, very important. Creativity, problem solving, teamwork, oral communication skills. How do you convince people in an organization that they really need to take, play, take uh, attend, pay attention to cybersecurity if the people preaching this message don't have the right oral communication skills, handling complexity for industry was extremely important. And here you can see quite a bit of divergence with the education sector who really don't place the same importance on critical thinking, who don't place the same importance on handling complexity. On to the next slide, please. We also asked about professional competences. Does industry and education consider that the same professional competences are important? And once again, you see some discrepancy. Security risk assessment, really important for industry, far less for education. Understanding of system logic is almost totally neglected in the education sector. So. Here we see in green the very important skills considered by both sectors. In red, the skills that really they don't think is so important and is not really having an impact on industry. Next, we ask for an assessment about the capacity of young graduates in these areas. Next slide, please. In terms of transversal competences, once again, we see quite a bit of difference. And surprisingly, it's actually industry that assess the skills higher than education. Problem solving, education, think that 78% of graduates actually have a high level here. The industry, slightly lower. Uh, written communication skills. Once again, a slight discrepancy, but not so much when we look at the, the level of tertiary education graduates. Next slide, please. If we look at the professional competences, we do see quite a few differences. The security risk assessment, but only 56% according to industry actually have the required level. You can see these figures are considerably lower. We found through our examination of these issues, of the assessment of competences and of the importance placed on competences, we did come up with a number of findings. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Firstly, we can see that oh, next we also these are the interviews that were conducted and we're just showing you this table of interviews to show you that really we did reach out we did interview a lot of people but maybe there are people in the room right now who'd be willing to continue with us and take part in a one-hour interview so that we can continue to build 
on our findings. So what did we find out? Next slide. We found out, first of all, that yes, there is a real problem. And it's mainly for young people living in Samoa, in Nepal. They have no means of developing their knowledge in this field. Therefore, one of our key findings is that it's extremely important that we start developing an online kit to enable young people who are living in some of these countries to actually continue with a training, improve education and training. We also discovered that teaching in the tertiary sector must be much less theoretical. We need a bigger connection to everyday issues. We have to raise awareness of the importance of cyber security at all levels of education. There really is not enough collaboration between industry and education. We need to find ways to do this. One of the good practices that we came up with, for example, is in Denmark, where there is now a national hub where industry, the cyber security industry, and the tertiary education system come together, exchange ideas, and try to develop the knowledge between them. We need to boost diversity, upgrade recruitment procedures. And here we discovered, for example, in the Netherlands, the Ministry of Health are using social engineering for much more efficient recruitment procedures, but we also need to scale up knowledge, knowledge sharing, set up an observatory of good practices. There are some good practices out there. How do we scale them up? How do we ensure that everyone can benefit from them? What's our next steps? 2023, we're hoping to set up a hub. We're hoping to raise awareness in industry about the advantages of closer cooperation with education. We will be focusing on capacity building to promote, promote knowledge sharing. We'll be encouraging and supporting participation of the under 30 age group and especially of women. And when we look at countries, for example, in Africa, this is a growing economic sector. We need to train our young people to draw benefit from the economic growth in this area. We need to support the revision and the update of education curricula at all levels to make us all much more aware of cybersecurity, but also to bring up that talent pipeline so a lot of young people are ready to work in this area. And we need to set up a training program for the Global South. This is basically all I've got to bring you today. I hope it's been of interest. And once more, I do thank our sponsors who have supported the research so far. And I do hope that there will be other people, other organizations ready to, to join us and to support the ongoing work that we're doing in the field of skills and education. Back to you, Mallory. Thanks a lot, Janice. Um, excellent presentation and right on time. Just to remind the room that we'll have a portion for Q&A at the end. So if you had questions for Janice, hold on to those. We're going to go next to Nicholas, who's going to present on the draft report from Working Group 1. Sorry, Mary, this is Wout. I think that we've now foreseen to hand over the, uh, the, the document to, to Paul and to the sponsors, and then we move to, to Nicholas. Great. So it's an official moment with a photo, and then uh, we move on with our session. Oh, thanks. Okay. So if I could just come in here, we are absolutely delighted to hand over this report. There are a few printed copies. We greatly appreciate your support, NASC and the Sydney Fund. And I know that our collaboration is going to continue into 2023. I hope you're satisfied with the work that we've done so far. And we look forward to our continued collaboration. Over to you, Mallory, to hand over 
the report. I don't know if you want to catch us all in the photos. It's up to you. Can the, the camera turn to the handing over the report? Is that possible? We've got it on camera. Um, there it is. Good. Great. Oh, now I see Nicholas again. So it <laughs> moved back the camera. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I am here. So my name is Nicolas Fiumarelli. I am the working group one chair, uh, the chair of the working group one on the Internet of Things Security by Design. And this time, uh, this year, we started a research about best practices on the Internet of Things security. Um, well, the, the title of the the heading of, of the research is Standards and Best Practices Adopted in National and Regional Policies and Regulations Relating to the Security of the Internet of Things. <clears throat> Here is a little introduction of is the presentation there. Here is a little introduction on, on a little of background about the quantity of IoT devices being connected to the Internet. Um, this came from the Statista in 2022. And it is expected from this graph to have at least 30, uh, 30,000 million devices connected to the internet by 2030 for different purposes, right? From connected vehicles that are emerging a lot in, in some of the global north, really, uh, from, to IoT infrastructure, you know, in, in industries, IoT is being used uh, in an industry fashion way. Uh, also, payment terminals, different uh, devices or machines you, you see in the street, inside the places, uh, you know, cameras, well, uh, and, and nowadays more remote process control devices. So, <clears throat> with this advent of, of the quantity of these devices being connected to the internet, there, there, is a, a, there are full uh, threats around that because uh, if, if this quantity is being increasing and um, these security threats are, are being and vulnerabilities are showing up so this will result in, in a spread of online harms online uh, and growth in, in the criminal misuse case so uh, we have a very strong issue right now is a it's a problematic that need to be solved how to to make sure that these devices have full uh, security capabilities because if not uh, there will be sensitive data information, personal data, and different kind of things that could be adulterated. So, at the end, it's important to, <clears throat> or, or the aim of the, one of the aim of the working group one is is to, to do that right to start deploying the, the best practices and the, the best technologies around IoT security on the different categories of security you can you can see. <clears throat> Here is a, a overall picture of the research. We have analyzed with three researchers, four researchers actually, because we have one researcher that is a voluntary one, uh, about 30 policy documents that are from different types, like current national government policies, regulatory frameworks, and code of practices around the world, uh, or specifically to, uh, on for IoT. And we covered more than 20 countries. Here you can see some of the, the countries that were uh, taken into account. Uh, was very difficult for the researchers to find uh, documents that are specific for IoT. Uh, one clarification here, as I said, is these documents are policy documents or regulatory documents, so we are not taking into account all the best practices that came from the standardizing entities, right? Uh, we start from the policy document that was like, uh, the new thing we, we, we were trying to do. So to know what are the actual uh, uh, 
the, the actual deployment of technologies or the actual regulations uh, regarding these, these technologies. So here you can see some of the countries that we take into account. Uh, we try to, to find documents from all the regions uh, in a way that is uh, equally distributed. We lack uh, from documents for the Latin American and Caribbean and the African region because there is still in progress this uh, the, the creation of these laws or the creation of this regulation is underway. So we will, will be something for the for the future. Uh, just to mention about the, the research phases very rapidly, we started in mid-April in 2022 with preparatory meetings uh, with me as the lead researcher and the researchers. Then in late April to early May, we have some uh, desktop research in, in trying to find extra documents because uh, from the last year, we have a, repos we have a repository of the IS3C full of documents, but that, that repository was full of documents of different nature, as I say, like from policy documents, regulatory documents, but also these, uh, uh, how to say, the, the standardizing entities' uh, best practices. So we cut the, the documents to have only these uh, policy documents and also did this extra desktop research to trying to find more documents. We uh, also send messages to the wider community in order to find these missing documents. And at the end, we, we, we found uh, from the countries where, where we've think is very well represented. And then in May, we, we had some training and briefing of the research team in setting some parameters for the research, what, what they are going to, to be collecting from these documents, uh, different parameters, like for example, uh, having the reference links that the documents point, having different risks or challenges that the researchers identify. Um, also, we needed to categorize these best practices in different categories. Um, then the, the stronger phase was from May to October, uh, where we worked in the, in the properly say, the, the analysis of these policy documents, uh, capturing or collecting all, the, all these details on what are the best practices mentioned, uh, what are the stakeholders approached in, in these documents, because sometimes it's a document that is for the manufacturers, sometimes it's a document that is uh, for consumers, right? So at the end, there are different stakeholders involved in these requirements. Uh, some of them are requirements, some of them are recommendations from the policy level uh, thing. But so we needed to, to, to capture all, all these best practices. So in October to November, we did like a discursive or compilation of these documents in a digest uh, in order to, to analyze and compare and and see what, what are the be most best practices being referenced in, in these policy and regulatory documents around the world, what are the, the, the best practices that are uh, most close to the, to the theory, right? Because we see that is, there is a, a strong gap between the theory and the practice, um, because every day uh, IoT at the different standardizing levels is evolving, right? Different technologies, we see the advent of the quantum computer, so you need to we need to update the, the, what are the algorithms that are being used in, in this IoT and to have a balance because these devices have constrained memory, constrained uh, uh, batteries. So at the end, it's, it's very difficult. So these, these standards are evolving all, all the time. And there are some best practices that were mentioned in, in, in more than three of the documents. So then we, we have this... Uh, uh, the presentation here at, at IGF 2022 in Addis Abeba, and the next step is to uh, go with the global consultation. We already started uh, doing this with, in our networking session, and we'll collect all the feedback for all the stakeholders globally, and hopefully in the following weeks we will have in the IGF review platform the, the report there for all stakeholders to, to feedback. So with this feedback, we will collect all them in January, February 2023, hopefully before the, the deadline of the Global Digital Compact, we will have the final report and, and disseminate this to, to stakeholders. So just for you to know a little, I will go a little rapidly because I know this is a general session and I don't have so enough time for all the document, but just for you to know that there are we identified four different categories of best practices. The first one is about privacy and exposure. We really uh, create this set uh, category that 
this compound of, of several things, for example, on, on encryption practices, on encryption practices, on minimizing the exposed attack surfaces on the devices, but also on the interfaces part, and then the a secure management of keys, right? And, and with a focus on, on personal data as well. Then the second category is about the update. <clears throat> you know that this <clears throat> is a whole problem, how to update these devices with, with the last version of the libraries. So uh, this category focus on keep software updated, blocking unauthorized entities for manipulating the, the internal firmware of these devices, uh, about how, how the device work in, or how these updates are, are being done, uh, and about uh, updated policy as well. Then the third category is about non-technical. We put that word because these are some uh, practices or activities that are considered best practices that are not necessarily are uh, technical things. So, for example, to have vulnerability disclosures periodically and these reports uh, public, uh, education and uh, education things that sometimes uh, when up uh, in some of the policy documents we have seen that there are education programs for these devices to. Uh, or videos and different material that the devices have for the end user to understand or the consumer to understand what, how they, they need to configure these devices and so on. So also about labeling programs as we have seen in, in Singapore, Finland, USA and um, different countries, uh, they are having labeling programs that are uh, regular, uh, like frameworks. Um, also about the communication, uh, uh, to have a, a, a space for the users to to, to bring support, support channels, etc. And the four categories about operation and continuity. It is about uh, not leaving the the user uh, or or the device use the default password. Uh, like will be mandatory for the users to to configure a, their own password. So these kind of things. How to when the connection drop, the device need to fail safely and securely and maintain information. It keeps sensing right the, the information and then when when it's connected again, they send a batch of information to the to the uh, interface, so to not lose that because sometimes these devices can be critical. We have seen with electrical vehicles, uh, different medical supplies, uh, things that could work. <laughs> what happens if internet is, is, is shooting down? Uh, these devices need to fail safely, or, or at least to maintain being working without internet connection. Uh, also about end of life strategies, uh, the manufacturers cannot maintain the devices forever in their life, so there need to be a, an ending time or, or a setting parameter to, to say, okay, we are updating the libraries until this date. Uh, so logging about security events, if some security thing happen in the device, uh, this could be automatically notified to the manufacturer, also to the end user. And then about secure view boot procedures, if the firmware image is adulterated, uh, then the device uh, will not start to, to scan or, or to scan or to sense or whatever the purpose of the device is. So also the actuators, if you if the device recognizes that the, the integrity check fails, they, they, the device is not going to work because it will be uh, something dangerous, right? So this is like an overall picture of, of the different uh, categories of best practices we found. Also here there are uh, differences about, because some of the documents were open consultations for the countries, and some of them are like recommendations for the technology or science uh, institutes in, in the countries, like for example, the NIST, but sometimes it's not a requirement, so we needed to differentiate it. Um, we found that there are more recommendations than requirements, that, that is something problematic because uh, sometimes the the recommendations are not taken into account, right? So requirements are something more strong for the manufacturers, the consumers, and et cetera, that, that need to, to be compliant with, with these uh, policies. So then you can see all the, the types of, of best practices are more recommendations than requirements. Um, then, yes, the, there are different documents here, but I will not dip in. Uh, but well, the, we found some challenges in, in finding like these top 20 practices that we are still finishing, uh, because as I say, there are different types of documents. Uh, we try to, to pay attention to, to the documents that establish stakeholder responsibilities. So that is something that we were very interested to have it as best practices. Also a priority was given, for example, to, to practices coming directly from the regulators or, or the policy maker instead of this open consultation that a lot of countries have open consultations, 
but maybe it could be biased because not don't, not the different stakeholders were there. So sometimes this is failing in terms of consensus. Uh, so that that is a, a grain of what what we have done this this year in terms of this research. Um, well, some conclusions conclusions. Sorry, that we finished was like this need to be an evolutionary war because, as I said, a lot of documents, and in 2022 also, in Latin America and Caribbean and in the African region, there are a lot of policy documents being created right now. So also we we concluded that the adoption of the best practices is increasingly urgent, uh, as we have seen uh, less requirements that, that, that recommendations at the end, so there is a strong gap between the theory and the practice. And there are topics of relevance that, that were not included, for example, about the quantum computing and different things that are happening right now in, in the world. Uh, we didn't find any of mentioning of this in the policy document. So we are really concerned about this. Uh, the researchers were really concerned about non, not having a sufficient uh, knowledge from the policy makers and decision makers uh, point of view, because uh, there are uh, strong things happening nowadays and this could be very dangerous, right? So that, that is, we will go to the open consultation, as I mentioned, in, in the following weeks. Um, this is very relevant to the Global Digital Compact also. There are different, uh, there are uh, two different uh, key points of the Roman of the, the Global Digital Compact. One is on ensuring uh, trust and safety, that, that key component, and also about the ensuring the human rights on the digital level. That is uh, the, the other point of the Global Digital Combat that is interrelated with, with this research. So thank you so much. If you have questions or comments, I am open to answer. Great. Thank you so much, Nicolas. Um, uh, Louise Marie, are you online to present in the next section? I haven't seen. Um, we, we will have a Q and A. Yeah. So do, ho do to hold on to it. I think we will, um, have only really one more presentation from Allison next. If Allison, you're ready. I think we just have to skip Louise Marie. She's not online. I saw Louise before actually, she was in an earlier call. Okay. Let me just, uh, share a screen with you. Great. Go ahead. And then I've got some PowerPoint for you here. Okay, great. So I'm just checking, can you see this? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So, well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And um, I've been working um, with IS3C on this fairly short piece of work, actually, since September 2022. So it's fairly new. It's, it's fresh. And what I've got for you here is really um, some progress up to date. So as I say, it's a, it's a very short piece of work um, in September. So thank you to colleagues um, for inviting me here and thank you for the presentations we've seen up to now. So I think this really fits in with what we've seen up to now with particularly the education piece from Janice. You know, we can see that there's lots of interest in there at the work from Nicholas, thank you. And Louise, I'm sure will probably jump in a little bit later. So the Technical Envoy Office released a call for contributions to look at the Global Digital Compact, which of course um, arises from other work, central work for the United Nations, uh, the, the futures work, and there's a, lots of background to this, which I won't go into actually, but the website's there and there's a call out which has now been extended uh, the contribution is going to fit into work, United Nations work next year in 23, probably on into 2024. So I think definitely there's mileage in, in IS3C taking this forward and really um, developing what we're contributing here. So the website's here. You can have a look at the website. You can look at the, um, the idea behind this is looking at the global digital compact and how we can actually create the compact with principles that are agreed and widely um, participate to, you know, to call in participants globally to contribute to this. 
And what we've been doing at, um, here is reaching out to our members and trying to um, generate interest in making contributions into this. And um, the principles themselves at the moment are here. So the eight principles at the moment are involving connecting everyone in the goals of having a free, sorry, skipped a slide here, of having a free, um, let me just go back. Here it is. So a free, open and secure internet. So I've just highlighted this here. These are the goals. So to achieve these goals, what we have is obviously we can't have rules based anymore. So we're looking at principles. So the eight principles that have been set out up to now are the principles of connecting everyone, protecting data, applying human rights, uh, the idea of digital commons as a public good, very much like fresh air, like water, uh, the regulation of um, artificial intelligence, accountability for discriminating and misleading content, avoiding fragmentation. And this has been picked up in earlier meetings today. There's been some really interesting discussions uh, talking about accountability in there, also talking about actually trying to get metrics together and other areas. And this is where I come in with my particular interest. So I have to declare myself as a trust researcher. So I spoke with a senior security practitioner, UK based, but for a multinational company. And the feedback here was actually very practical, you know, looking from industry. Um, the comment was, we're never going to get to utopia. It's not possible. But the question is, what's best for the most? And this comes back to, you know, ethics, historic ethics, ben, you know, Jeremy Bentham and utilitarianism. So, um, as I say, this was a comment from industry, but taking this forward, and I'll, I'll come on to some uh, research that backs this up. So, there is looking like the recommendation is going to be trust, because it's implicit if we have these principles that people, individuals, organizations, governments, supranational organizations will actually have to trust in the principles. So it makes sense that we actually have trust as a kind of a central cross cutting principle. And if it's there, then we can actually measure it. Uh, there's empirical research out there, there's literature out there of how we can actually measure this. And then we can look at, for example, connecting everyone. And we can say, well, if that has to be a trusted principle, then can we assess that? Can we monitor it? And if we have this principle of trust, then actually, yes, we can do that. So we can look at fragmentation, for example, we can get a metric for trust and then have a, a way of actually trying to monitor this. Protecting data we've mentioned and so on and so on around these, there's this um, equal balance between the principles with this argument. So here's some breaking research for you. And this is not um, um, empirical research, you know, this is very much discursive. So I'm a, a lecturer, I work in uh, business schools, and this is um, some conversations with MBA students, MSc students over the past couple of months. And what we did was we looked at these principles and we looked across the financial sector. So the majority of students are London based, but they're international students and many, many students, a high percentage from the global south. So from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, West Africa, particularly, and these are just some of the countries here. And this is what we came up with. So we looked at a multinational bank uh, who will be nameless. And then we looked across um, actually state banks from three global south regions. As I say, this is not empirically derived, so it's not statistically relevant, but it was very much yes, no. And what we did was we looked at each of the um, GDC principles. So, for example, connecting everyone, avoiding fragmentation and so on and so on. And in the eighth other area, we, we looked, we didn't look, but we found evidence. And I'll quickly go through. So, for example, protecting data, principle number three, in the multinational uh, bank we found it was explicit, it was there. We could see evidence in that bank of them having practices in place to protect their customers' data. They, all, they were also going as far to um, actually have um, mentioned of their supply chain. So that was an exemplar, if you, if you think. And then we looked across our um, 
banks from our state banks from the global south and we did in fact see evidence of protecting data there then if we looked at human rights we saw in our multinational um, bank yes there was explicit evidence in there we found from one of the global south banks there was nothing explicit in the second case yes and you can see in the third one and if we go drop down then to the other area, and this came out in our discussions, we found evidence of trust. And we found that in terms of the banks saying that they wanted to have trust, trustful, trustworthy relationships with their customers. And I mean, I'm, I, this is, as I say, this is just breaking research. And I'm going to take this forward and uh, reaching out if there's interest in developing this. But these are based on conversations with students looking at the um, websites of these companies and you know the i suppose that in some there's, there is some mileage in here in trying to do gap analysis of you know once the principles are agreed then actually we can evidence their presence and this gives us then a metric whereby we can look at once the gdc is being implemented we can uh, collect evidence and we can also build a monitoring tool. So that's me. So thank you. Thank you to colleagues for inviting me. And there's some um, contact information there for you. So thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, has Louise Marie joined? Not sure. That's all right. Um, we'll... Melanie, this is well. I understand that she's in another session. Okay. So I asked her where she is, but she's not here. All right. um, the only thing that I can say is that she's working on data governance and data security, and that she's comparing different legislations on uh, on on this topic. But exactly what she's studying at this point, I'd hope to hear just like you today. So let me stop there. Thank you. Sure, I think it just means we'll make it to Q and A Q&A faster, which is good, because um, I know folks are lined up. So um, the last one, just uh, I'll keep it brief because it's not a report on work done, but rather a preview of work to be done in 2023 from the working group three. This is on the procurement and supply chain management in the business case. Um, so the idea being that we would like to first do some um, scoping and mapping similar to Nicholas's group's approach, um, just to understand what's currently out there um, in terms of procurement policies that focus on, or at least include, um, safety and security uh, standards. Um, so having a full scope of those um, will also give us an insight into the challenges and opportunities. So through um, really um, sort of um, best effort desk research leading to um, more um, collection and documentation of these procurement policies and supply chain policies. Um, we would also at some point need to narrow the scope, I believe, to not include every single um, possible um, document or policy out there, but just to what speaks to the UN's and IGF's specific sphere of influence um, in order to actually come up with some relevant and actionable guidance um, that would come out of that scoping and mapping. Um, but based on that, um, or, or in order to achieve that, I think we would need to also involve um, researchers in um, conducting surveys and understanding what some of those challenges are in order to develop guidance. And all along throughout the year um, of work that we've planned out in our work plan, um, we'd be um, ideally conducting outreach as well so that the folks who have been interviewed or who we've cited in our work will remain engaged um, and invested in the outcomes of the, of the report. Um, so again, I wanted to keep it brief because I think that we'll have some discussion and questions from the floor about all of the wonderful work that's been presented today. So um, I can do my best to look at the room if there are any questions, but and Nicholas, if you could help me if there's any in the chat and we can, um, we can create a queue that way. Okay, I think in the chat, we didn't, we didn't have any question here. Let me also check if, if someone has read them. We have one here in the room, Selby, down here. So go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Lynn Haas with the uh, 
uh, U.S. State Department Cyberspace and Digital Policy. Uh, to Nicholas on the uh, IoT, um, a lot of uh, we're starting to see a lot of motion towards zero trust frameworks, which is going to make the IoT issue maybe even more complex. Um, did the did the uh, scope of this report comprehend some of that activity in that direction, uh, especially even down to the kind of semiconductor supply chain uh, issues? Yes, well, the, <clears throat> there were different approaches that are similar to the to the zero, as you said. Uh, we have found several of them, but we we have not seen uh, that as a as a common best practice being mentioned in in, in the documents. But hopefully, uh, when more policies will be appearing, uh, mentioning these frameworks of, of zero. Uh, security. I think that that that, that is a, a very very good approach that is is happening nowadays uh, to to not uh, touch on on nothing. And I think also our researcher Savio one uh, something to mention about that uh, because uh, he follows some of the documents that, that were in that way. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. I'm I'm Savio, one of the researchers of the uh, this research. Uh, and we do not, uh, we did not find, we did not found uh, any document uh, talking about zero, zero trust. But we had one really good document from uh, published from the ENISA, uh, which is one of the organization of the the United uh, European Union uh, that talks about uh, be, good practices, best best practices in. in in regard to cybersecurity by design in the whole supply chain of, of IoT devices, from the design passing passing through uh, the manufacturing of, of integrate, integrated circuit chips and so on, to the end of the life of the device. So it might be helpful helpful if you want to check this document. Okay, I think we have um, no questions on the queue online or in the room. Um, Wout, I don't know if you can come on and close us out, but um, I hadn't prepared anything other than to just thank everyone for coming and thanks to all the researchers. But um, yeah, go yes, ahead. Yes, I can come on, Mary. Thank you. Um, I think that. Um, First of all, thank you all very much for coming and for, for joining this session. And I think that uh, our researchers have shown what sort of impact is going to be made by this dynamic coalition. Also that we uh, plan to have more work coming up in the, in the next year. This, this will include two, two working groups that will actually start and three that sort of are announced of people wanting to start these uh, working groups. And two of them are on post quantum encryption, so we will have to see whether they can be merged, but they were very recently received. And the other one is on three specific standards on DNSSEC, RPKI, and IP version 6. And anybody interested to work with us is invited to do so. I've put the, the link in the, in the chat. Um, again, I'm very sorry that I could not be, be with you today, but um, I've tried, but I couldn't even get to the to the reception desk and sitting here in the chair just manages. So, but that, uh, that said, um, I think finally, I want to thank the researchers for their work and that uh, the, the report that is out and has been handed to Paul and our sponsors is online at this moment. I put the link in the chat as well. Um, as Nicholas said, there will be an open consultation probably two weeks from now, starting for about a month, so that people can comment on, on, on the Internet of Things security by design, uh, policy recommendations and best practices that we have found. And the other work will, will start in, uh, in, in next year. The data security and governance working group that was not present, presented on, I understand perhaps that the report is even there in December. But I'm not totally clear on that, so please excuse me for not having that information. So let me thank you, start thanking the sponsors, but that who did never have been possible. In the first place, there's SIDN, the .nl registry in the Netherlands that, that sponsors us uh, as a coordinate, coordinative group. We've been sponsored by SIDN Fund and NUSC for education and, uh, and uh, a skills working group. 
and we have Microsoft who sponsoring us for the for the IoT working group, and UNDESA sponsors us for the data security working group. So there's a very diverse set of organizations. And looking back from when we started two years ago at the virtual IGF with no funding, only ideas, and very, very, very slowly picking up uh, the, 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 the traction that this dynamic coalition like this needs, we were able to, to announce after a year working programs. And then we found our first sponsors because we were able to become very concrete. And that voluntary work put in by a lot of people is extremely, extremely uh, appreciated. And from there, as you could see, like Jenna said, how many people voluntarily joined to come up with this data shows that a lot of people care about the topic of education and skills. And somehow we will have to make sure that this, that this, this is going to widen and that more and more people understand that th this dynamic coalition, but also others, can make a difference in the topics that they work on. And I hope that next year, when we are in Japan, in Kyoto, that we will be able to present our next reports and, and the, the second phase of working group one and working group two, so that there actually is going to be the, the step from the theory of having a digital paper on the IGF website and elsewhere to a practice, so that, so that actually we move towards a more secure and safer world, which is the motto of IS3C. So I hope to be able next year to share again with you some major outcomes, but also that more people will have become involved by that time as they will see that these are important topics that will protect our society in the next decade. And with that, let me stop there. This, um, I think I've said enough. Um, if there are any closing remarks from the room of you, Mallory, as, as chair, again, thank you very much for stepping up because I really could not make it there, and it's very, very much appreciated. So I hope to see you tomorrow, but there's no guarantee I'm afraid. Okay, that's I think um, we, we have one hand up from Nicolas. Nicolas, you, you may proceed. Okay, thank you so much. No, I just wanted to add that uh, from the working group one, if you when the open consultation and the document is public, if you know of any policy documents or regulatory documents mentioning specifically IoT security, please reach to us because we wanted to include in the research as well uh, for future work as well. And I have a, a comment also on a different totally thing. I think the the future work, uh, I mean these new working groups such as the quantum post encryption or different working groups about different security technologies in the critical infrastructure, such as what Baud mentioned about BGP, SEGAR, PKI, DNSSEC, IPv6 SEC. So this is very important, I think, from my personal point of view. Uh, in, in, I work at a regional internet registry in LACNIC. So I think this is extremely uh, important to to have this because nowadays these technologies are not law enforced in some manner. I, I, I am not saying that is the correct uh, solution, but maybe we need to look into some uh, work or research about that to, to know what, what could be the next step to, to, to assure that the internet is more secure and safer in terms of these protocols, security protocols as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thanks so much for all your hard work. And um, see you tomorrow or at the reception. And thank you. This is Wild. Can you please bring the flags and the, the rest of the reports? Some people who may want it can get it, of course, now. And can you please bring it so then I can bring them back home uh, tomorrow? Thank you very much. All right, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.